Uno de los principales retos que enfrentan los ejecutivos que están a cargo de dirigir organizaciones de analítica de datos es cómo estructurar su equipo de analistas y científicos de datos. En esta charla, Bryce Murphy y Rodrigo Pichoni nos comparten su experiencia de cómo se organizan los equipos de datos en clubes deportivos de acuerdo a las distintas necesidades y tipos de datos que utilizan. Thanks, Santiago. So, Santiago did a good job of explaining kind of the last eight years of my career, but I think when you're building a data department, it's really important to understand, at least for me, like where I came from. So, I actually started in sports medicine, athletic training. Uh, I was a physical therapist aide, and then I got into strength and conditioning, and then I was a youth soccer coach. So, I've kind of touched on every department that you'll probably have in a club. Uh, and obviously now I'm on, more on the data side, so I have kind of that full 360 view of where we've been and, and where we need to go. So in a lot of clubs, this is kind of the current state of affairs. You have your different departments and they're all operating independently of one another for the most part. So they're, if, if you paid attention to the previous talks, they're all asking good questions but not together, not utilizing one another. And so that always brings me back to the scientific method. Uh, you heard Darian ask about a uh, coaching staff came, member came to him. He asked, how can we prepare for counterattacking with our next opponent? Right, that might be one question. If you heard Jordan earlier, how do we evaluate uh, if the club is making good decisions monetarily Uh, you heard Dave talk about how do you evaluate players, right? So all these things always start with asking a good question. And it's really to remove, Jordan talked about this earlier, but to remove the emotional bias from your decision making. And we're not here to, the data doesn't tell you what to do, but it can assist in that process, right? So you start this wheel of the scientific method, hopefully to make better decisions. And then whatever your end goal might be, uh, It would be, oh, obviously it's to maximize performance across whatever you're doing, but those goals could look different depending on the department you're in. So that could either be, well, there's probably really two, winning more games or making more money, right? What else? Like, why, what else are we doing? So ideally, all of these departments come together, you have a cohesive unit and you're picking information from every single department in order to make more informed decisions. Uh, is Marta in here? Marta actually touched on uh, one of my favorite books as well previously, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. If you haven't read it by Daniel Kahneman, highly, highly recommended. But essentially, it's using heuristics or past experiences to make snapshot decisions. So if you were here with uh, Dave and Darian earlier, you might get an ad hoc request and a coach wants an answer on the spot, right? So you have to have tools in place where you can answer those things quickly because an hour later, a day later, a week later, that's too late. Like the coach doesn't care anymore. Now you've lost a piece of your buy-in. And then I'm kind of making a leap to why this, I guess, connects to the data department, right? So you have your fast setup where you can do things quickly, get everything up and running versus your slow setup where you do have time to utilize your data scientists and really dive into the data and, and Maybe it's like collecting data for a whole season in order to make predictions about the future, right? You don't need to be able to answer those things right away. So the fast department setup, this is like if you're, if you're working with a sports organization or a club and they haven't had a data department in the past, usually they want to get up and running right away, right? They don't want to hire people and then like, hey, it's going to take us two years before you get anything. They want to have something... Uh, in a week, in two weeks, in a month, right? So you got to be able to go pretty quick. Um, that's where these like third-party software companies can come in handy, right? So they become your data engineers, your data scientists, and you can take some of these off-the-shelf solutions and unpackage them. They have all the APIs set up, all the data is ready to flow in, and you can get up and rolling that way. Uh, you can use free tools, you know, R, Python. Uh, ChatGPT has taken everyone from an undergrad uh, programmer to a PhD level programmer, you just got to ask the right question. So definitely leveraging some of those uh, tools as well. And then obviously, you know, we have, we had StatsBomb, we had SportLogic come up here and talk, but utilizing some of those companies, I guess like offloading some of the work to them so they can do it for you, right? That's what they do all the time. 
you don't need to try to hire one data scientist to do 40 different things. That's your fast department setup. Now, if you have the resources and the time and buy-in from the top level, you can take the slow route, which would be taking all those disparate data sources that we saw, uh, whatever, you know, StatsBomb provides you, SportLogic provides you, it might be heart rate data, GPS data, like everything you can think of, and it's got to come, that, that's where your data engineer will bring all that data into one place, into a warehouse, and then you have your different data marts where your scientists can access that data, your analysts can help you uh, relay the message to the front office, to the coaching staff, and then your front end or data viz specialists can uh, visualize that for you as we learn it's very important. You saw with Dave's presentation, there's lots of different ways you can visualize data and you gotta be able to choose the right one. No matter which route you go, the roles are gonna be pretty similar. So you're gonna have your data engineers, right? Whether you get them externally or hire them internally, that's kind of the base level of your pyramid, right? Those are the, that's the foundation. And then you're gonna have your data scientists there to explore the raw data. Uh, find patterns, relationships. This is your detective, right? So that middle piece of the pyramid. And then finally, you need your storyteller or the one that's going to be talking to the people that are making, that are actually making the decisions. And you can see in between there's different specialties and subfields. And, you know, maybe sometimes your data scientist is also a data engineer. It just depends on your resources and how you want to set it up. Speaking of how you want to set it up, there's a few different ways that it's done and that it's recommended. First is your decentralized structure, right? So you have a platform that's provided by your IT department. And in that kind of first slide we saw, every department operates on their own, right? So the data analyst from the scouting department has no clue who the sports scientist or the data analyst in the performance department is, and they have no collaboration but they're working on their own specific questions, not leveraging information from the other ones. Then you have your centralized structure, right? So after, if I go back to decentralized, that's kind of like what most people start with, right? That's their, your base level, like you just want to get into data. Now you have some data maturity. You're like, hey, we should uh, collaborate across our departments. Maybe we make a data team, right? Now you have everyone working centrally supporting all of the different uh, decision makers, but now you don't have anyone in the department. So when a coach comes up to you with an ad hoc question and they want to know on the spot, they don't want to walk upstairs to go find the data team, right? They want someone embedded on the day to day. And then you have what I call the center of excellence, which is kind of the best of both worlds, right? You have people embedded in the department that are collaborating with the data department that works independently but they are there to answer those day-to-day -day questions. And then finally, this is more like on the fast setup. You have this third-party software or kind of like embedded consulting where you take one of those out-of-the-box solutions. They're going to provide you data engineering, data science, data analysts, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll have a uh, point of contact in your club that will help translate uh, back and forth, ask the questions to them. Uh, and then you embed a few data analysts within the department, so it's kind of probably the fastest and, and most and cheapest route to go, I would say. Uh, if we look at pros and cons, decentralized, like I said, super easy to adopt. You can get it up and running pretty quick, uh, but they're not going to coordinate with one another. There's no standardization. You're not going to move from one department to another, typically, so you're kind of stuck unless you're the director of analytics of that department leaves. And then since you have to hire people for every single department, your headcount is going to get big quick. All right, so in the, in the end, it'll probably end up costing you more. Then you have your centralized, which obviously they are more coordinated. They're going to standardize everything they do. Uh, you don't need as many of them, but they're going to be isolated from, with, from the actual departments that are doing the groundwork. And they might not even know how to answer the questions, right? If I go ask a data scientist, oh, this is a, a true story, right? If I go upstairs and ask the data scientist at the Orlando Magic, how much force does this guy need to produce laterally to be a good defender? They're gonna be like, what are you talking about? How do you measure that? Like they don't know, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know the context of it, right? So having 
someone embedded that understands that is very crucial. Your center of excellence. Uh, the only cons are, I guess it, it is, it's hard, it can be hard to focus on strategic projects, like if the embedded person within that is answering too many ad hoc questions, because that can be a thing too, like every second the coach might have uh, a latest, greatest idea and you're kind of at their beck and call at that point. Uh, and then you do need a large number of personnel to run an operation like this. And then finally, your embedded consulting, it's super easy to adopt. It's, it's probably your most cost effective, but you don't necessarily know what you're going to get out of it. And if you don't have someone that's worked with those types of systems before, it goes from a fast process to a slow process, right? So you want to hire good people that know what they're doing that can get those systems up and running quick. So I guess what's the point of having a data department? Like who's our main customer? we're trying to capitalize the athlete, right? They're the ones drawing fans in, ticket sales. They're the ones winning games. They're the ones out there sacrificing their body. How do we maximize their potential? Uh, and not only from like the physical, psychological side, but if you wanted to trade them too, like are you doing a thorough evaluation of other people? Do you have the data set to do that? Do you have the ability to do that? And everyone's going to have different questions about the athlete. So your front office staff, they're interested in player acquisition. They want to maximize revenue. And obviously, they want to win games. Your coaching staff, uh, we had a question earlier on opposition analysis. Uh, they want to know about team performance. How does this individual fit into the team? They want to know about their individual performance. You can see in the top left, um, ideal position. So if you saw Dave's graph, like, that hockey player might be uh, ooh, a good defensive attackman, but they're not great on offense. Is that what you're looking like? Is that what you need in the moment kind of thing? Your business department, again, they want to maximize revenue. They're looking on ticket sales. How can we commercialize this individual? Um, and I think Julian will talk a little bit about that later. He's super into commercialization, so make sure you stick around for that one. Uh, you got your sports medicine team, right? Your physios, your ATCs, chiros, massage. They are judged on injury management, how quick they get people. RTP stands for return to play. So how quick are they getting people back onto the pitch? And you can, you can collect data from all the different clubs, right? So if, if I take a, a grade two ankle sprain, I know it takes seven to 10 days. If I'm quicker than that, you guys are doing good. If it takes you longer than that, you better have a reason, right? So these things, you're getting judged on these things all the time. You've got to have data to support it. Uh, your strength and conditioning staff, load optimization, or if you, if you pay attention to the NBA, there's a lot of uh, load management, they call it. So you're resting players, making sure that they're ready to go when it matters. Injury mitigation, so they're working with the sports medicine team. Uh, I know in soccer, there's a lot of ankle sprains, right? So how can we preemptively do something about it. You can tape ankles, you can get your soleus, a calf muscle, super strong, right? There's things you can do ahead of time before you just have millions of millions of injuries and lots of money wasted because injuries cost money. And then finally, your sports science department. That's what, that was my role uh, with the Orlando Magic. So I was kind of, I was the gopher between the data science department and the performance team, right? So I was helping answer questions ad hoc on the spot with the coaching staff, working directly with the players, but then also asking some of those longer term questions of the data science team upstairs. At the end of the day, there's no perfect playbook, right? Every, every club has to have buy-in. The front office staff, the sporting director, they have to understand and have a mission of where they want to go. And before you have that, uh, I think someone asked a question about how do we use stats bomb data if the sporting director doesn't believe in it. Well, you're not going to be able to do anything if the sporting director doesn't believe in it, right? So it's up to them to take that leap and trust, and, and it's up to us to help slowly educate them. Uh, you guys can read the rest of that. But basically, different, different contexts require different structures and processes. So you just have to evaluate you know, how much money you have and how much you're willing to put into this and what you want to get out of it. 
this is just a super quick snapshot of what I'm currently doing with IMG Academy. Um, I would like to have our own in-house slow department where, you know, we have, we have 1,500 student athletes, right? So we would need a lot of people, and you guys will see it. There's nine sports. So these are all the sports that we service at IMG. There's 61 teams. Uh, I'm the head of data management analytics, and I have one person working with me, right? So there's two of us for 61 teams. Then <laughs> now in Mexico. Uh, you can see, you know, 12 baseball teams, three football, tennis and golf are individual, so that's why there's nothing there. Uh, but yeah, lots of, lots of teams. Ideally, you would have a me for all of these sports, and really, ideally, you would have a me for every single one of these teams. But that's, not, that's a lot of money. 1,500 athletes, and you can see like the, the breakdown of each sport. Um, with that being said, we definitely went with third-party software, and we try to commercialize it that way. Like, We can't afford to just pay everyone. But with 1,500 athletes, we have a data rich environment that no one else in the world has like you can't go anywhere and get every single sport so if you're trying to train different models or computer vision so we get people all the time trying to partner with us uh, and that's how we make it work well first of all i want to thank the organization for the invitation to being here uh, like uh, I was presented before, I'm head of football analytics at Atletico Mineiro Football Club in Brazil. And uh, today I'm going to talk about how we can leverage all this structure that Bryce just mentioned, uh, how we can use that to impact the strategy of your organization, in this case, a football club. So once we have the everything set up, so you have hired the right people, you have your data sources, you have all your details running. The first thing that comes to mind to decision makers is, okay, now we're going to have a lot of dashboards, a lot of PDF reports, and of course, that's a big part of the job. I would say it's 90% of the output of an analytics department, but what I want to talk about here is where the real value lies, which is the 10% that rarely happens, but when it happens, it's where it drives uh, a club forward, an organization forward. So essentially my presentation, it's how we can use all these resources to drive and to push your organization into more optimal pathways of uh, management and decision making. So we have to start by defining what is football strategy, right? If we go around the room asking, uh, it's going to be many different answers because it's a broad concept. Uh, I like this definition by Marketing Insights. Uh, it's a consultancy firm, a uh, football consultancy firm, and essentially they divide it into two, a business strategy and a football strategy. The business strategy, they are talking about efficiency of processes of departments, and they are talking about success on and off the pitch. When they're talking about the sporting side, the football side, they're talking about having a clear game model and a clear player profile in order to achieve success on the pitch. That's a nice definition, but we have another one here from the Journal of Sports. This one is not tailored to football, it's sports in general, and they basically put everything together, right? Sports and business is pretty much the same strategy, it's a strategy, and it's about being in front of your competition, gaining a competitive edge, you know, winning market share, which in football terms would be winning. Putting these together and some of my uh, conceptions of it, we can define football strategy as everything related to the optimization of on and off the pitch processes to the provision of guidelines and implementation plans at an operational level. These optimizations should ensure that the organization have a competitive edge over its competitors and essentially leads to its definition of success. So essentially what we're saying here is that football strategy, it's about optimizing processes in order to ensure that we have a competitive edge and eventually reach the success uh, that is predefined by the organization we're in. Now that we have defined uh, football strategy, I'm gonna show you guys how we can use an evidence-based practice in order to impact this football strategy. EBP, or evidence-based practice, is a, is a concept that comes from healthcare. And essentially, it's a problem-solving approach 
to the delivery of healthcare, healthcare that integrates the best evidence from studies and patient care data with clinician expertise in patients' preference and values when delivered in a context of caring and supporting of organizational culture, the highest quality of care and patient outcomes can be achieved. So we are talking about using data and hard evidence combined with context and expertise in order to deliver, if you are in an organization that supports this, the best possible care for your patients. If we get the same definition, but tweak it to our definition of football strategy, instead of delivering healthcare, we're trying to use EBP to optimize process. Instead of uh, integrating uh, data from uh, patient care and clinician exp expertise, we are using studies from internal and external resources and integrating with the club context and technical expertise. If this is done in an organization that has courage enough to actually apply it, the highest quality of process and football success can eventually be achieved. So how does the EBP look in practice? Essentially, everything starts with a problem to solve, right? After that, we define a research question. We search for available research and or uh, conduct an internal research using the resources of the department. We appraise the evidence from these researches. We integrate it with the technical and uh, technical expertise and the club context and we disseminate the information. We're gonna go one by one, so it's gonna become clear through an example, a very simple example. So we have a problem, a simple one. Our club currently have a high payroll and our squad has 29 players. So we have to define a research question in order to tackle that problem. One method to do that is the PEO method, where you have to state your population, so what's gonna be the focus of the research, the exposure, so what do you want to change? What kind of, uh, what do you want to intervene upon them? And the outcome, what's the, uh, the expected impact that you want to have with this research? So in this situation, in our example, we're going to see what's the ideal squad size. So the squad size is the intervention that we want. That's the, the variable we want to tweak of a Premier League club playing in the Champions League. That's our population, very specific one that will optimize the relationship between death and cost. So essentially the outcome we want is to have a good relationship between the death of your squad and how much you're spending with it. So in our example, we conducted, and there are external research on this, but in our example, we conducted an internal research and we found that uh, in order to, to see how many percentage of minutes uh, of teams playing the Champions League and in the Premier League, how many players are playing in what percentage of minutes? Our evidence from this research found that no more than 23 players played more than 5% of the minutes. That means in our case that it's expected at least six players to play less than 5% of possible minutes. But we have to integrate that with the club context, right? Or technical expertise. And in our example club, we're gonna lose two players for the African Cup of Nations. So we put everything together in a presentation, all the evidence we gathered, all the club context, and we make a strategic recommendation, right? So we are recommending the club to offload at least four players, going from a squad size to 29 to 25, and consequently we will reduce its payroll and possibly can even generate revenue through player trading. Okay, but how does this whole journey we went through in a EBP uh, framework impact the, the football strategy of the club we are in. So let's go back to our prior definition of football strategy. So we are talking about optimization of processes. With this small research problem, we optimized our squad building process, right? We provided a clear guideline for the decision makers in order to operate better the squad building process of the club. So we are telling them, you gotta have 25 players due to the conditions you are in. This will lead us to have a competitive edge over our competitors because clubs that don't have this optimization in place may be wasting their resources that could be better allocated to other areas of cost that we are not gonna do it. So we have more money to spare between quotations marks. And essentially, this can, since we have more money to spare, we can attract better players or players that are expected to contribute more to our win probability in games and essentially our definition of success. So EBP can basically be applied to anything, right? Uh, both on, on the pitch and off the pitch uh, topics. So some more common topics within a football club 
right? In the areas of action. So should we, when should we start doing weight training at the youth level? Is there an optimal style of play in our league? Can we predict when a player will decline so that we can define an optimal selling point? How can we optimize the player play role to ensure that we have the highest possible expected performance within our budget, which is basically a little part of what we did. So the, this EBP framework can assist in answering these questions and these problems within a club um, operation. But we, we don't need to stop there. We can go to more um, unorthodox uh, questions that also can or cannot be answered with EBP, but they can definitely follow the process of trying to answer these problems. So should we invest in an automatic wall, those that jump by itself for free kick takers, or should we invest in a Bielsa golf cart? What's gonna have the most value for money on that? Can we create a more evidence-based test to, to interview our future uh, employees so that we can ensure that they have a higher probability to succeed in the club? Should we invest in a cryo chamber machine or should we renovate the club's hotel? What has the best value for money? Okay, so this method can, with the resources that Bryce put it before, can really help leverage the strategy bit of the club where, it's, where the real value lies. And like I said, the sky here is the limit. To go through the process, everything can do. But if you're gonna guess an answer or not, of course, depends on the topic. And I want to leave a, a final message. Um, as you know, having a data department by itself, it's already a competitive advantage uh, against those who doesn't. And the first layer of this competitive advantage is to have better data, right? So if you have better data, or if you have data and your competition doesn't, you're already ahead of them. But then other clubs might have access to the same data as you. Then the next Compet uh, competitive advantage come when you have better data scientists, better data engineer, better processes, so that you can have better models in the competition. However, from there, you have basically two places you can go. If you use this model, this data, to support uh, preconceived notions that, not you, but that if the decision making maker is using these models in order to support uh, preconceptions, then it's the same thing of having no department at all because these decisions were gonna be made anyway, regardless. So you're basically back, you're spending all this money and you're basically back to having no department at all because these decisions were gonna be made. However, if you do use this data to challenge these preconceptions so that a, a, a preconceived idea might change or even be more thought of. That's where the, v the real values lies. And that's where the competitive advantage grows exponentially. Thank you, and if you have any questions.